I'm going to call the council to order. Let, uh, it's 7 o'clock having arrived. I'm going to call the council to order. Let the role reflect that all council members are in attendance and a quorum has been established. Uh, tonight, uh, we had on the agenda under administration, let's see, under uh, community, community development, the number, uh, number two of resolution to consider a reversal of decision by administrative official. That applicant has uh, withdrawn that request just for tonight, and we're going to reschedule that action to be considered uh, on April 16th City Council meeting. So Monday, April 16th, the applicant has uh, withdrawn it for tonight. And uh, for those of you who are here for that, um, there will be another mailing sent out to remind you when that uh, public hearing will be. So it will not be tonight, okay? Next, uh, item, Council, we have the minutes of the regular City Council meeting on March 5th, 2018. Any additions or corrections to the minutes of that meeting? Seeing none, they stand approved. Council items, council items be considered. Any other council items be considered? Council will go to consent agenda. Your wish? Councilmember Brox makes a motion to approve. Second by Councilmember Folt. That motion is now before the body. Any discussion to that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The motion prevails. Uh, next, uh, Council, we have a special guest tonight, uh, newly elected state Senator Carla Bingham is here to address our council. And uh, Carla, welcome, Senator, to, uh, to the City of Hastings Council meeting tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't know if you guys can see me over the computer here. You but have to get uh, a little booster step. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Mayor and Council, thank you. Just wanted to briefly st stop in. I'm not going to take too much of your time, but um, I know some of you met some of you for the first time today, um, but I'm State Senator Carla Bingham. And uh, in week, uh, let's see, uh, five of the session and just wanted to, to come down and, and say hi and introduce myself and also let you know that uh, I'm on the Environment Committee and uh, Veterans and Military Affairs Committee and really have been building relationships uh, here in Hastings. Um, I've met with Hastings Family Services, United Way of Hastings. Um, I've toured the uh, vet's home, met with uh, Regina um, and the chamber this, this morning. Uh, and so um, just really fostering and building those relationships to be the best advocate uh, I can for the residents of Hastings and the businesses of Hastings. So um, I look forward to seeing some of you. I think it's, uh, is it later this week? Thursday, thank you, um, at the League of Minnesota Cities event. I'm a former city council member and former uh, Washington County Commissioner myself, so local government is definitely where it's at, and you guys really um, have the most impact. So I certainly um, have a special place uh, in my heart for local elected officials. So um, with that, uh, we've passed about two bills in the uh, Senate, uh, and it's a bonding year, and I definitely do have the bonding request in for, for the Hastings uh, City Hall here renovation and for the uh, veterans home so uh, we'll see we'll see how the bonding um, bill flushes out um, you know you never never know and so just uh, plugging away up there but uh, certainly don't want to take up any more your time but just wanted to come down and say hello and uh, we'll, we'll be back after session to kind of give you a wrap up or uh, maybe we can meet with the delegation or something uh, myself and representative Jurgens or whatever you guys want to do so and oh sorry uh, and I am um, keeping tabs on highway uh, 316 uh, renovations as well so any questions uh, anyone thank you senator for taking the time coming down here we appreciate you being here thank you enjoy your evening okay thank you okay council next we have awarding of contracts and a public hearing we have a public hearing uh, vacation in the valley block five and six hudson manufacturing and who's going john you're going to take care of that for us welcome to the meeting uh, thank you mr mayor city council members i'm just waiting for a light to go up here to show the drawing that I am uh, going to be showing here. So I will, there it goes, start the uh, introduction and the drawing will magically appear hopefully. So what we're back before you tonight is for a vacation of alleyway at the Hudson Manufacturing Building that is formally owned by the city, which is nice to say. This is an area that is located between Highway 61 westward towards about Lock and Dam Road. And it has a varied history of of, of various vacations that have taken place over time. And during the last month, we were made aware that there was a small portion, uh, about 10 by 20 feet, uh, that appeared not to have been vacated when other portions were vacated in about 1927. And so we want to be able to make sure that that area of the alleyway is vacated. And uh, 
to ensure that we do not have other areas that we are not aware of within this area that have not been vacated, uh, we're asking for a full vacation of that so that it may be, it may be duplicative in some ways that uh, we've had variants or vacations in the past, but this should take care of everything on the project. So on the map here, it shows where we're looking at for the vacation. As part of the vacation, uh, we did have a public hearing that was ordered at the last meeting, and this is a part of a public hearing tonight. We are certainly recommending approval of this from an ownership standpoint, public use standpoint. This has been essentially privately used by the Hudson Manufacturing Building for the last 70, 80 years, and will be privately used as part of the Confluence Development Project as we move forward. So at this time, I could stand for any questions, or you may open the public hearing. And just as a reminder on this one, we a simple majority is necessary for action. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that presentation. I'm going to open up the uh, public hearing. Anyone here would like to speak to the uh, vacation of Valley, Block 5 and 6 at the Hudson Manufacturing? Welcome to the meeting. Can you give us your name and address, please? One second, please. I'm not prepared like you. Okay. Hello, Mayor, City Council. My name is na Bruce Ruder. I live at 321 First Street West. Okay. This property we were just talking about, that's to walk the cattle down to the river. That's on my property. That's on my easement or on my abstract. Uh, I'm here to state the facts. Number one, at the last meeting, you were vacating First Street by the river. That's, that was a uh, easement with the railroad. That's where they loaded rail cars. There's never been a street there. That's where they loaded rail cars. Uh, number two, East and West Street, First Street, went all the way through from our place down to East Hastings, right through Hudson. That's the way it went. Uh, that's a fact. Number three, this alley that we're showing here never existed. Uh, that was my grandparents' house that lived there, and the city, or Hudson, didn't take it over until the 60s. I remember the house there myself. Uh, now with the, the way you have, I brought this to Mr. Hinman's attention quite a few times, but the way you're creating with the 60 apartment buildings coming out of there and it's underground parking, and it'll be coming up onto the dam road. There's not, there's not 60 apartment buildings, there's 22 apartments. Okay, and, Wh and whatever. 60 hotel rooms. One I mean, thing I'm said 60, but wh whichever. I, I'll go with you, 20. I just wanted to but stay with the facts. I, I wanna make this point, Mayor. When, when Hudson was in business and using that for a parking lot, and at 3.30, what we had, they're coming out of Hudson, they're looking down the damn road and up this way. And we're doing the same coming out of our first street. That's been first street in Minnesota since before Minnesota. But <coughs> meeting at the top of the hill, somebody's gonna get hurt, it's suicide. You know, it happened before, it's gonna happen again. Something's gotta be figured out there. That's, you made, thank Mr. you. Ruder, you made a claim that you said you owned property. Huh? You, you made a claim, though, that you own property. Yes, I do, Mayor. What I'm asking is, do you own property on what we are considering to vacate? Uh, I, I believe you are trying to vacate ours. Like I told Mr. Hinsman before, there's that little house on the corner there of our property. That used to be in, well, what you call now the damn road. That was a lot. That house was too ramble shack to move when they hooked a rope on it, it fell apart. So they bought him a new house and that's the one that's sitting there now. That's the way it goes. And that property, that little house, had a 10 to 15 foot alley or uh, access to the Mississippi to get water and to feed their cattle. Okay, now Mr. Reuter, when I look at the map and we see those red lines, I don't see it encroaching upon the property that you just described. No, right there where you're going. That's, that's the easement. Is that lined up with First Street that comes, you know, the alley and by uh, the Legion? That's First Street. That's the original First Street in Hastings. These are facts, I can prove them. Uh, but it's not on your property. It was on my grandparents' property. 
My grandparents owned that corner on the northwest corner of Spring and Second Street. There was a house. Okay. On the northwest it got corner. Got moved. Okay. But we're talking northeast. about the northeast. That's what I'm talking. Northeast. Okay. Northeast, I'm sorry. That's where my grandparents grew up. John and Ruby Ruder. Okay. okay. Thank you for your testimony. Yes, thank you. Okay. John, do you have any comment about the, uh, the property and who owns the property? Uh, Mr. Mayor, City Council members, uh, we went through property title search for, uh, to ensure ownership of the property, not only upon acquisition of it, but also upon sale of it. And I don't recall anything coming up that showed that we did not own the property in that. And I'm looking at uh, Mr. Flegel just to, to verify that information. Uh, thank you, Councilor. Your Honor and Mayor, uh, Council. There has been an extensive amount of title work done for not only the city's purchase of this property from Hudson, but also the sale to Confluence, along with very detailed survey work that covers this area as well as the entire property. Nothing in there supports what has just been said that the Rooters or anyone else owns this property other than formerly the, uh, the city's ownership or Hedra's ownership. So I, we have had discussions with Mr. Rooter in the past, probably five, seven, ten years ago, about other claims that he's had and based on all of that we did some extensive looking into what his claims were in other areas uh, towards uh, the park but nothing associated with this property so from everything I'm aware of I think there is no basis for what I've just heard. Thank you. I'll give you a final comment Mr. Reuter. Uh, that was never an alley <laughs> like that. I told you I could prove it. That's one of my facts. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone else who would like to speak uh, to this vacation? Anyone else would like to speak? This is a public hearing. Anyone else would like to speak to it? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing. Council, let's have that discussion on our agenda. The, uh, what's your wish, Councilmember Balsanic? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. So, Regarding this piece of land brought up by Mr. Reuter, uh, is there any record that the Reuter family was paying any property taxes on that property at all? Council? If I could, Your Honor. No, your, no Council Member. You know, one of the things that makes it very interesting, and I think we talked about this at the last meeting, is that this is a lot of platted property from 1857 or 1850s. And uh, what was probably seemed a good idea back then isn't a good idea today. Obviously, First Street was never built uh, in recent memory along any of these right-of-ways. You know, there was true that there was a rail yard at one time and, um, and went across that property. So, sorry, Mr. Rear, we just concluded the public the public hearing. Letter that you sent me, and it's not the same as that, but on board. Okay. Look where the line's drawn here. Okay. Look where it's on here. Sure. Which one are we going by, Mayor? Okay. I'm going to go with the one behind me. Okay. So, uh, as I was saying, you know, we have a. I'm, I know we've had issues in the past, particularly in this part of town, and sometimes on east side too because of the plat of the 1850s and we've run into issues where we had to uh, make sure that uh, what we're doing um, uh, matches up and I have complete faith and confidence in the title work that we did that Dan had just described and who the owners are so I have uh, confidence in that. Is there any further discussion? The motion is needed. Councilmember Vaughn? Councilmember Vaughn makes a motion to approve the vacation. Is there a second by Councilmember Leifelt? That motion is now before the body. Is there any further uh, discussion to that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of that motion say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The motion prevails. Next we have, now if anybody's here for the, the next item on resolution regards the reversal of decision by administrative official, the inpatient treatment facility at 620 Ramsey Street, that has been moved to April 
16th, Monday, April 16th, and so uh, by the request of the applicant. Next we'll go to, excuse me? Okay, oh, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, next, we have a resolution for the City Council. We have an award of contract under public hearing and contracts. Riverfront Renaissance Phase 3.1. Nick, welcome to the meeting. Thank you, Your Honor. Good evening, Council members. Uh, like the Mayor said before you tonight, we have a resolution for your consideration to award a contract for Phase 3.1 of the Riverfront Renaissance Project. You may recall that we had gone through a bidding process about a year or so ago to uh, conduct this very project, although at that time we uh, received just one bid and it was uh, quite extraordinary uh, in its price. So we took a step back, repackaged how we were going to structure the, the bidding uh, documents and the options that were entailed within delivering the project and brought it forward from December, uh, did a bidding season December and January and open bids in mid-February. So I'll just walk everyone through a little bit uh, what we've got for the project scope to refresh memories. Essentially it's just the alley space between the bridge parking lot on the uh, west side and Sibley Street. This is the last remaining chunk of the Riverfront Renaissance vision that the city went through in uh, doing a, a visioning and, uh, and scoping plan just a few years back. What the project includes would be to replace the surface of the alley. I think we all are pretty familiar with the fact that it's very degraded at this point in time and is in need of some repairs and replacement. Uh, we would replace that with a concrete surface like what you see between Sibley and Ramsey streets on that same alley corridor. Uh, Centerpoint Energy is going to take up the replacement of a pressure station facility that they have back there. It's a small cinder block type building right now that's uh, pretty aged and, and uh, degraded itself. So they'll refresh the look of that. They also have uh, work to do on their underground lines. We would have some curb and gutter along the northern side of the alley to help with uh, containing uh, snow removal and, and protecting the edge of the pavement, facilitating drainage a little bit better. And then we've got some reconstruction happening in the parking stalls that are right next to the American Legion building towards the eastern end of the alley. Along with that, something that we've been uh, trying to go after uh, from the beginning with the visioning for this project would be to try to remove as much of the overhead aerial utility clutter that we have in there as possible. And so one of the features in the base scope of the project would be to furnish conduits underneath this new pavement to allow that to happen. I know the lighting isn't the best in the room right now, but I hope you can see that there's a wide variety of different overhead utilities uh, strung between uh, about 10 or 11 wooden utility poles in the area and the buildings on the opposite side to provide service level uh, systems there. The other things that you would see with this project would be the dumpster enclosures like what we built on the other alley between Sibley and Ramsey, uh, very similar to that, a little bit bigger to allow for the, the multiple restaurant uh, businesses that are along that block each have larger dumpsters and uh, we'd make space for that. Uh, again, the existing wooden poles eventually would come down uh, as the aerial utilities were put into the conduits under the surface. We'd have some lighting enhancements and then so, some uh, accent and landscaping pieces along that corridor. The whole intent to make it a more inviting space for that pedestrian level activity that we want to encourage between that parking lot area and the uh, levee park space uh, interacting through there. Uh, what we would not get with what is being proposed for the contract award tonight would be the screening wall in front of the substation on the north side of the alley. That's the primary piece that would be eliminated. Uh, so what I've done here in this is strike that from the list of items as well as the image example. Uh, here's just a an example of what that alley generally would look like after we're, we would finish a uh, concrete surface. You can see a dumpster enclosure there. Here's a little bit more close up view of that. 
the facilities on the uh, alley in question would be very similar to this. Recapping costs. So our, our prime contract bid that we would have under this scenario uh, would be for a little more than $500,000. Uh, we do have to include some contingencies for the unknown. Of course, we're working in an area that uh, we'll have some underground items there and, um, and history has shown that we, we can run into surprises, unfortunately, but we wanna be prepared for that. We have project overhead, that is the design, engineering, uh, the inspection, the testing, the project management types of costs that we have going into uh, carrying out a project like this for about $165,000. And then the last components would be the actual burial of those aerial utilities themselves. And with that, uh, one of the pieces is to have Xcel Energy convert their overhead electricity system to an underground feed that re requires ground mounted transformers on either end and feeding their, their primaries through the conduits. That's about an $86,000 expense right there. And then we have to go through the process of reconnecting each and every one of the 11 buildings along the corridor back to that new underground electrical system. So total price tag uh, under that scenario would be uh, a little over a million dollars when all is said and done. Uh, so I will turn it back to the mayor and stand for questions. Hey, council, uh, we have this item before us, the award of contract for Riverfront Renaissance, phase 3.1, what is your wish? Council Member Vaughn? I just have a quick question for Nick. Uh, Please. Just want to confirm uh, that last number that Excel is putting on there that all the other utility companies do not charge for that service, but Excel is charging for relocating their utilities. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Further discussion, Council. Council Member Fultz. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Nick, I just had a couple questions about um, timing of this project. I know that you want to have it accomplished over the course of the summer, obviously. Um, I had a couple concerns. The business owners that are downtown are very sensitive right now because we've been under construction for an awfully long time. In particular, the restaurants that bookmark that alley, they have great concerns um, because they're looking forward to the summer and you know having visitors come in and use their patios and, and the like. And so I was wondering if you could um, speak a little bit about just what are the impacts that the downtown is going to possibly um, be under and how are they going to try to do s staging to minimize the impacts to those restaurants you know that are along that area yeah it's not an easy task council member we we know that uh, there's still going to be some level of disruption there uh, what we we're uh, pretty focused on is containing that impact to just the alley space uh, itself. Uh, there will, of course, need to be some access back and forth for the contractors to get in and out of there to do their work. We did, on a, on a positive note with Excel, uh, work out to be able to use some of their property for storing materials and parking equipment, those sorts of things. Um, I, I don't think there's a very realistic uh, possibility to to not prohibit traffic through the alley for the vast majority of the time while the project is going there simply just isn't enough room there it's about a 15 16 foot wide space that we're working on and have to go all the way down to underground construction um, at least in the initial stages it'll be very uh, cumbersome to try to get that work done in there but uh, that said we do always make a point of working with contractors and highlighting the importance of their being good neighbors while they're in the area. We've had to do that with the last three phases of Riverfront Renaissance and uh, it's never perfect. Uh, we, we would love to be able to get to a, a place where these things almost can happen without anybody noticing, but um, I'm afraid there aren't methods in place quite yet for that. Um, so it, it does take a lot of coordination and communication with the building owners and we're prepared to do that. Okay, um, yeah, I would just 
ask whatever you can do to uh, keep perhaps the construction from spilling around the sides mm -hmm. so that they're not interfering, you know, with, with um, like the lock, and don, the lock and dam eatery, you know, for instance, you know, their new patio being, you know, facing the, the riverfront and then on the other side, like the onion and the legion, you know, whatever we can do so that right. the construction doesn't spill out, you know, past or interfere with their businesses and patrons trying to enjoy the outside there. And then my um, second concern was in regards to Rivertown days. I'm excited, you know, that uh, most of it has now moved down um, to the riverfront, but how um, will the construction play? I mean, it's just kind of bad timing. I'm excited that it's all coming downtown, but it's kind of bad timing to have the alleyway mm -hmm. project going on kind of simultaneously. And so I was wondering if there's been any steps to, you know, will construction kind of cease during that time period to pull back all of the equipment or? Yeah, it would. We would mandate that they leave it a nice, as as clean as possible, given the activities that are going on, and consolidate their equipment and their piles of materials, and just stay away from the area for those several days that Rivertown Days is going on. That was uh, a requirement from the word go on uh, setting up the specifications for the project. Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Got it. Another discussion, Councilmember Lightfall. Nick, just a clarification, because it's not my wheelhouse. When, obviously, I don't think there's anyone downtown who wouldn't like to see all those lines under the ground. <laughs> that, that's a given. The process of it, I'm not exactly sure how it works. Does that require, like, power outages, or do lines get run and then connected and then taken down? I mean, what kind of disruption are we talking there for people? Um, yeah. So, Council Member, we, we do know that it would require uh, powering down for temporal amounts of time, but we would intend to conduct that uh, either in the overnight hours or at a time when we know a good number of the businesses aren't even open for business. We would have to coordinate and get schedules and, and find sweet spots where the uh, disruption on that is minimized. And it comes into play with some of the equipment that we're installing too on the electrical side that would allow us to do uh, individual service ter changeovers without impacting the rest of them. So, for instance, there, we might at the beginning have one or two periods where all of them have to be powered down. Again, we'd pick a minimum time of disruption to do that, get the devices in place, then that would allow us, when the time comes, converting to do one by one by one. When you use the term temporal, would you have any, I mean, we're talking restaurants in that block, freezers, refrigeration units, such, brewing units, I mean, what would be a temporal amount of time that something might be? Yeah, it's, it's likely it's a couple hours. Okay. Uh, and again, I, I, I wanna stress that we're gonna look for those windows where it's not during operational hours for businesses, if at all possible, uh, and, and doesn't negatively impact refrigeration and those sorts of things. Councilmember Lund. Thank you. Um, yeah, how, how much time are we talking overall for the whole project? Considering that gap of time, several days being shut down and everything, what's, what's your start and end? And We'd intend to start in the latter part of April, if at all possible, with uh, the, the removal of the pavement surface and the start of the underground uh, trenching and, and conduit installation work. Uh, we would get to a stage by midsummer where we'll have some kind of surface back on it, if not concrete. Uh, but then we have a period where these these service change or overs are happening, and that that will be drawn out just to the point because we've got to do them kind of individually, one by one. Uh, we're still anticipating start to finish with wrap up activities into the fall, but there will be different blocks of work uh, character that are taking place along the way. So the initial stages are uh, the more disruptive, uh, tearing a lot of things up, getting the underground put back together. Then we have kind of an intermediate stage where these conversions are happening. And then the, uh, the final part of it would be the finishing touches, the elements that are on the surface, such as building the garbage enclosures and some of the landscaping that tend to happen towards the end. Thank you. So yeah, there, there's a fair amount of concern about 
of the disruption that's gone on over the past few years, as, as uh, Representative Fultz has mentioned. And, and, um, and I just, I, you know, I want to make sure that we're um, sensitive to that. Um, when, when you look at the project overall, what's the most disruptive to, you know, to the function of those businesses? What's the most disruptive part? Um, I understand that the on and off switch will take a couple hours and we can plan that out a little bit more and I don't think that's probably the biggest concern. It's big equipment and noise and dirt and dust and everything. So um, when do you think that portion is going to take place? Obviously they break ground end of April if this goes through and when do you think that, that portion is going to be and do you think that's probably the most chaotic of, of, of all? Yeah, that initial phase is going to be the noisiest, the dustiest, uh, the most in and out truck traffic to be able to move materials around, digging trenches, uh, uh, putting conduits in the ground, uh, coordinating with some of the work that the gas company has to do. Um, that's unfortunately the nature of the beast when it comes to getting those sorts of things done. Uh, once we get to a stage where that has been completed, it the ease of disruption starts to pick up. I'm not gonna say that it completely disappears because there will, there will be other things along the way, but they're not, uh, their duration isn't for weeks on end. Um. Councilmember Fulch. Thank you, Your Honor. Nick, would, be there, would there be any chance that um, as you establish specifically like what the milestones are gonna be for the project or the construction project that you could share those time frames with us like the project Gantt chart so that we could share that with the business owners so that they're aware of when those most disruptive times are gonna be and they can plan for that? Yeah, we, we would have an all out communication plan like we executed for phases one, two, and three where we're making everybody aware of the intended schedule from the very beginning and then checking in on a weekly basis with activities that occurred, what's forecasted, the longer range issues and, and items that have to be completed. So I think that in a way communicates those, those elements. We don't know the exact start and start start and finish dates the contractor has to supply us with what right. their mobilization timeline is and then we would incorporate that into mailings and flyers that we put out to the uh the individual businesses along the corridor and the rest of downtown probably for that matter just so there's general awareness of what's going on does that answer your question it does. I'm really glad to hear that you've already thought about that. Um, the DBA already has a website that we can upload information to, and they have okay. a distribution email address. And so if you, um, I would be happy to help share that information with them um, just to help supplement whatever it is that you already have planned. And okay. so, yeah, just keep me posted. That'd be, I know that they're very concerned, mm -hmm. particularly, like I said, the restaurants that are bookending that alley. So, yeah. okay, thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. council, I need a motion. We have a motion. Councilmember Vaughn makes a motion to approve, seconded by Councilmember Balsanic. We have a motion before the body. Is there a further discussion to the motion? Okay, seeing none. All those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The motion prevails. Next, we have the uh, under community development, the community development annual report. John, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Council members. I'm going to pull that up here and. Um, I distributed in your packets a copy of our annual report for uh, for the year here, and I'm going to reopen it again here. I think I might have lost it. Uh, bear with me for a moment. There we go. Okay. Cool. The the mayor did a very nice job here uh, about a month or month and a half back, highlighting some of the activities that we've been involved with in the city. I like to be able to, to supplement that with our annual report on community development activities here. The community development department consists of three people, myself, Justin Fortney, the city planner, and Morgan Hill, the economic development coordinator. And so I'm gonna highlight some of the projects that we've been involved in over the last year and some of the things we've done. So starting on the, on the planning commission side of it, uh, we had a few approvals last year for things that we'll see under construction coming up in 2018. One of them being the Glendale Heights 5th edition Voyager Estates apartment. 
This is an 89 unit apartment building located just east of the industrial park. The approvals were granted last year. Permits for construction are in the spring and we should be construct seeing construction there shortly. We also have something under construction right now, the Couturia Spit Funeral Home, which was the old uh, KC Hall on Vermilion Street. That'll be a really nice redevelopment of that site as well. Other things, Spiral Brewery opening up in downtown here when the next month we anticipate there was some, uh, some parking issues that we dealt with there and some other related permits. With CrossFit, we had an industrial park land sale, one of the first ones we've had in a number of years for construction of their new building and uh, that should be opening here in the near future. Uh, the work on Great River Landing, which I'll get into more detail in a moment. And then we've started work on our 2040 comprehensive plan, which is something we do once every 10 years to chart out our development, desires, goals, and objectives. And we've been working with a 20-member resident committee uh, that has been meeting once a month. And we will be having draft, we've been working right now on draft versions of that plan, and we will bring you more information to you in the near future on that one. In addition, we had a, a medical office building at 1465 North Frontage Road. The nice thing about this, it was a city-owned property, so we were able to, uh, we'll be able to in the near future, reap some of the benefits of the sale of that property as well as the uh, development that will occur there. And I think I went through a few of these already. As far as construction activity last year, we had about uh, 30 single-family homes that were constructed, which was up slightly from the 22 we had in 2016. Uh, we did have a, a large uh, art space apartment building last year for 37 units, which brought that unit total up more significantly. So that's the, the reason for the differentiation on that end of it. When you look at commercial permits, either for new, res new commercial construction or commercial remodels, uh, we're a little bit lower than last year uh, on the number of permits and the, the valuation we've received on that, but, but still consistent with what we've seen in past years. And the same thing with some of our administrative permits, the things that we handle without planning commissioner council review the fences, shed signs. So you take a look at building permits overall. I kind of go back here, geez, almost 30 years now it looks like. I think you all can re remember a time about 10, 15 years ago, we had a really high point and then we had a recession that occurred. And this is the point really to focus on is what's been really been happening since 2010. When you take a look at the, the graph here, you've got the total number in blue, you've got the single family homes in this lighter blue, which mimics this a lot. And you can see a, a trajectory up and fairly stable over the last five, six, seven years or so. We've, we've been fairly consistent on the overall number of permits that we've had. Taking a look at the, what we can anticipate in the future, Within our comprehensive plan, we identify areas within the city and areas outside the city limits that for future potential growth. And this map here shows some of those areas, areas that are either available right now for development or areas that we are considering in the future. Uh, a footnote on that, anything here that's, that's considered doesn't necessarily mean that we as a city are, are going in and actively developing it. This is an allowance that, we've, that we uh, would be acceptable to development within these areas. So when you take a look at what we have for volume right now, we've got uh, a number of single family subdivisions that have lots available right now, about 84 lots altogether. Uh, what we're getting to a standpoint right now is, is we've not seen much single family development of new subdivisions in the last 10 years. We've seen some reconfigurations of existing subdivisions, but nothing new on that one. Uh, and the, I think the issue that we're coming into right now is some of these subdivisions are getting a bit picked over. There's a, a few lots that are left, but not a large majority in a certain area. The area that we do have the most of lots available would be the Wallen subdivision. And there's a certain price point there that uh, is above what, what a lot of the market here is looking for. So that affordable single family lot development, we may be in a lack on that one. and we're. We're uh, asking those questions of developers too to see what we might expect in the future. We have uh, a lot of land supply that we have available, but we, we haven't been seeing the uh, resulting subdivisions come forward from that. And so when you take a look at our, our land supply overall, we, we have a lot of land. We just uh, really need to have, uh, I think, more development uh, proposals coming forward. When you take a look at some of our neighboring cities that are of comparable markets, they've been seeing higher single family volumes, new subdivisions occurring, and we're, we've been awaiting that to, to come, uh, but it has not as yet, so we're taking a little more active role on that. 
When you take a look at Hedra, I, I think the biggest news on that is no surprise to anyone. We finally sold the Hudson building, which is great. Uh, so we'll, we'll see going forward this year, the target dates would be building permits in by August 1st and construction within one month of that, final completion by the end of 2019. So again, we're looking at 66 uh, hotel rooms, 21 apartment units, and retail development, commercial development of 20,000 square feet within there, and then the development along the riverfront, and then also the addition of 119 stall parking space just to the south of it. We've done a lot of work on that project over 2017, primarily on the environmental side of it. We did a lot of soil cleanup. We did a lot of in, in the building, outside of the building, and uh, fortunate enough to receive a, a lot of good grant funds in there. And uh, we spent a lot of time on uh, different closing activities and other things over the past year. So it's nice to see that that development uh, is moving forward with us no longer the owner of it. I think I mentioned a little bit before that we had our a land for a dollar sale, which was the first one we've had in the, probably almost nine years in the industrial park, which is great. We continue to be involved with the chamber on their ambassador visits, which is a great way for us to get out and, and be involved within the community. And in addition to that, we've started up our own business retention and expansion program. What that is is essentially a, a visit that uh, Morgan Hill, our economic development coordinator, facilitates in which she, she'll meet with various businesses ask them how things are going, understand the business climate challenges facing them and, and how we might be able to provide assistance. So when you take a look at last year, we uh, visited 37 businesses. So that was nice to be able to do that, a program that we had not been able to do in the past. We also had a number of Hedra loans that we uh, facilitated last year. These loans helped to, for rehabilitation of this house here on 406 East 7th, the Spiral Brewery, and also for the Planet Beach building downtown. And so we, uh, we still have a lot of, that's still a very active portion of what we do, and those funds are available. We're also involved in their Open to Business program, which provides free one-on-one -on -one guidance, and also loans for people that are looking at new businesses or people that are already op operational to help them guide through some of the issues that they face. Uh, just as of uh, today, you may have, uh, received an email, we are finally shovel ready certified within the industrial park. Uh, what exactly that means is we have gone through a lot of due diligence that a, a business would need to go through to certify that the site is gonna meet their needs. So a lot of the back work uh, has been completed by us. And so this provides a better advantage for us to sell lots because we're in a much more developable situation. Plus we'll have the ability from Minnesota Deed and Excel Energy to help us market these properties. So we hope to see a better return on that investment as we move forward. In addition to that, we're working on our Vermilion Corridor study plan as we speak. And so we'll be having more information. There's a workshop coming up in, uh, I think next week on that one, where we'll be sharing more information on that project as well. One of the things that we've also done is gone through our economic development programs done a lot of revisions with Hedra's assistance to make sure that those are up to date. We've also been doing some active marketing, which we haven't done in the past, attending some trade shows, and really getting the word out that uh, we're here, we're available, and telling our story on that one, something that uh, we have not been doing, we have not really done in the past on that. Looking at uh, some of the vacancies that we have around town, uh, the total vacancy numbers went down a little bit over 2017 with some ups and downs and you can see some of the new businesses that we, uh, we welcomed into town in 2017. So at this point, I can stand for any questions. Thank you for that presentation. John, council, any questions or comments? Questions or comments? Council Member Fulch. Um, Your Honor, I would just like to say thank you, John, for all of your hard work. I'm, I'm always very impressed by um, the work that you do, you know, not to mention all of the staff, but um, you in particular, I have just been so impressed impressed and and I just give you just great great kudos and um and thank you for you know for all of your dedication to our community thank you uh, any further discussion councilmember Brock yes I'll add my thanks to that and also I have a question about what it means exactly because I've had business owners ask me to be shovel ready what exactly does that mean sure it doesn't mean that 
if there's any problems with the land, they're fixed necessarily, right? No, no but they'll, they'll have an understanding of, of what is going to be there. From a utility standpoint, uh, all the utilities are at the site. One of the, the biggest things that we've done, which took a longer period of time, we've gone through all the environmental analysis of the property, phase one analysis of that, also did some soil, soil borings within the property as well, so people can have an idea of what soil, soil, sort of soil conditions they may expect as they move forward. So those are, are two activities primarily that, uh, that businesses will, would need to do and would take time, and uh, we're ahead of the game on that one. Perfect, thank you, sure. appreciate that. Thank you, uh, John, and your staff. I, I think also we can probably throw that in there a little bit because I know the work has begun on the Vermilion Street Corridor, which began in 2017 that your department has been engaged with quite a bit, and also, um, uh, you know, what's the other one that's been there? I can't think of. Yeah, the comp plan, the 2040 comp plan. So uh, that's underway, and that's been under your guidance uh, in 2017 going into 2018 too. So two very important projects as well. So appreciate all that you're doing. And Absolutely. Echo Councilmember Fultz's words. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Council, next we have under administration the 2018 Rivertown Days Agreement. Melanie? Thank you, Your Honor and Council. Um, typically, this item is put on consent agenda, but um, we have been working with Christy and her team over the last couple months. It is Rivertown Day's 40th anniversary, and they are looking to make some changes to um, the layout and um, the event. So we've asked Christy to join us tonight and walk through some of the proposals. We have um, spent uh, several meetings over the last couple months working on a staff level with Christy and her team on uh, making sure that we're all at a good comfort level with their proposals. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Christy. Welcome, Christy. We're very glad to have you here. And I see Chair Rother is here. Aaron, nice to have you here. Thank you for being here. Christy. Thank you, Your Honor and Council Members. Um, I am here tonight to talk about something that I'm sure is as dear to your heart as it is mine. Uh, Rivertown Days, we are celebrating our 40-year anniversary uh, in 2018. So as Men Melanie said, we have been working with our Rivertown Days Committee and also with city staff um, on some changes that I would like to go over with you tonight. So to start, um, we met as a committee about a year ago and we came up with four primary goals as to what we wanted to see accomplished for the 40 year anniversary. So those goals included um, an increase in walkability, um, we wanted to be able to showcase the entire riverfront. Um, we wanted to drive more traffic to our downtown businesses, um, and we wanted to uh, provide a unique experience. So we're hearing a lot from our guests when they come down to JC Park. Um, they want to be able to walk over to the craft fair. I think that's how it used to be a few years before my time. There was great in, uh, walkability between JC Park and where the craft fair was. Um, so we were really hoping to be able to utilize the new Hastings River Walk and bring that feeling back. Um, and then we also, uh, since Levy Park has been open, we've tried a couple different programming options to include the pavilion and Levy Park as part of JC. Uh, but what we found is just the, um, the layout of the event and the um, extension of volunteers over those two parks, it just became, bird, it became hard. So um, we were really hoping to uh, drive the majority of our traffic to Levy Park this year. So what does that mean? We are asking for a few changes in our special event request. Um, typically, we have had the music stage, the food trucks, and the carnival down in JC Park. That has been the buttoned area. I believe all of you have been down there uh, to experience it. So this year, we are asking to move the music stage to Levy Park and have the main music at the pavilion. Um, we would also be asking to move our food trucks and our beer and wine tent to the north half of the Levy Park parking lot. Um, as far as the carnival, uh, we are asking for the use of uh, um, Hedra owned land on Tyler Street that is north of Art Space. Um, the carnival would use that empty land and then they would also use a portion of the private owned land behind um, Hastings Family Service. We do have approval from the private landowner to use that land as part of the event. Um, and then we would utilize the JC Park for the Arts and Craft Fair. So I'll pull up the map. I believe it's in your council packet. This is what Levy Park would look like. So if you see the 
red line, that would be a fenced in area. That's gonna be the buttoned area for Rivertown Days. Um, we right now have three controlled entrances, one on the um, west side near American Legion, um, one right in the middle in the parking lot, and then we would also have one over on the east side uh, near where the carnival would be. Um, we've been working very closely with city staff to make sure that traffic control, there's a one way in, one way out. Um, we've been working with Public Works. We did know that this proposal for the alleyway was uh, coming up, so we've been working closely with Mr. Egger on that. Um, and then we've been working very closely with our police department and our fire department to make sure that um, safety is the number one concern. Um, so as you'll see, the, the carnival um, over on the east side, we're gonna take up just a portion of that privately owned land, and then we'll have a controlled walkway on Tyler Street there. Um, accessible parking is always a, a concern of for ours, so we will be asking that both sides of Ramsey Street there between second and the parking lot will be used for accessible parking. And then we are also gonna ask that the um, west side of Tyler, just from second up to that curve, uh, will be no parking for traffic flow. Okay, speaking of parking, um, that's always a concern with our downtown area. So um, I worked with Public Works and Mr. Egger put together this really nice map for us. We do have about 265 regular parking stalls within a couple block radius there of downtown and then we also have street parking. Um, we are gonna use JC Park for event parking. Um, we're gonna use all of the uh, parking lots and then also have the big grassy area for uh, overflow parking. Um, as I mentioned, we'll have accessible parking outside of what's already plotted um, on both sides of Ramsey. And uh, we have worked with the Downtown Business Association and are asking for leniency on the two hour parking downtown so that uh, the reserves are not con patrolling the two hour parking that are already there right now since we're gonna have guests down there. Um, and then lastly, oh, the no parking on the west side of Tyler Street between second street and the river. As far as communication, uh, what we have already done as a committee, we have worked closely with city staff. Um, we have been working closely with our downtown business association to make sure that they're state informed. And then we also sent a letter to um, all of the residents and business owners in the downtown area and east of the train bridge. And then moving forward, we'll make sure we're, look, we're working very closely with our local media, KWA, the newspaper, and Hastings Community TV. Um, we'll uh, utilize our social media platforms and the website, and then um, the marketing committee is really gearing up to increase our number of posters and event schedules along with parking maps that we can uh, put out with area businesses <coughs> to make sure that uh, residents stay informed. Uh, so while the hassle, uh, just to close, <laughs> Um, we really wanted to be able to showcase our entire riverfront. Uh, there's been a lot of investment made in that area. It's gorgeous, uh, and we want to show it off. Uh, and we want to make better use of Levy Park. And we really want to increase the walkability between the two parks. We hear, that's the number one concern that we hear from guests is they want to be able to drive into the buttoned area and then they want to be able to walk to the craft fair. So we want to use that Hastings River Walk that's there for them. Um, we would like to be able to drive more traffic to our downtown businesses. Uh, and most importantly, we want to provide a uh, new and fun, unique experience for our guests. So with that, I will stand for any questions. Thank you for that presentation, Christy. Appreciate that. Uh, Council Member Lund. Thank you, Your Honor. Hi, Christy. Um, so question for you regarding parking. It seems like, um, thank you. Um, it seems like you've got a plan, but it's still gonna be you know, there's still gonna be some challenges there, um, especially not utilizing the other area as much, the JC area as much for activities. Um, just curious, have you thought about um, doing some sort of shuttle to like um, Kennedy parking lot and some other, you know, maybe Todd Field or some, you know, something sure. like that where there's some s s close but not too close where they could be, you know, every, 15 minutes go back and forth or something like that that has been brought up at a committee level we don't have an answer to it yet uh, we were actually looking at trying to provide a shuttle from levy park or, i'm sorry jc park up um 
no, it's a good it's a good suggestion. I don't have a concrete answer for you, but it's something we're looking into. I think we have a member from the public who'd like to speak to this, and so. <laughs> Mr. Likes, you had a comment? Oh, I do. Okay. <laughs> Pete Likes, East 4th Street, below the tracks. Uh, a lot of work's been done on that, but the, the concern of the, cons of the residents east of the railroad tracks is that the parking that you're going to need to facilitate what you want to do along the riverfront. It's Rivertown weekend. Everybody knows that the fireworks go off on Saturday night down in the river. And if you cross over the tracks, there's cars and boats and trucks, trailers, everything from the, from the tracks all the way to the boat harbor on 1st and 2nd Street. So me being a resident down there, and it's been presented to me by a couple of people that live down there, we're asking the city that uh, maybe you're going to want to look at, because of, the, because of the traffic that's going to the boat harbor for that particular weekend, we're going to ask that you may consider doing one side parking on the street because you can park two cars that can park north, eat two cars on, on the street, but you're not gonna get the boat through there for that weekend. And now, down there where you wanna put the carnival, down on that corner where Birchins used to have that pit down there, I, you can ask Chris over there, I don't think that piece of land down there is as half as big as Wilson Park, and when I was a kid growing up on Sibley Street, Wilson Park wasn't big enough for that carnival. That carnival's not gonna fit in that north half of that parking lot down there where I think you want to, where you're proposing to put it, I don't think it's going to fit there. Then you have, then you have the, the problem as we do when you have the car show. Tyler Street that goes underneath the railroad bridge. If the train's on the tracks, you got to have traffic into the east end for emergency, for emergency situations. Once again, you're increasing the foot traffic. You want to bring the people to the downtown area, which is fine. But you have to look at, uh, first of all, I'm going to address my end of town because of, the, there's 113 houses down there. There's probably, I'm gonna say 50 people down there are older than I am. <laughs> I'm old, but they're ancient, <laughs> whatever you wanna call it. So you look at, the, you look at the, the fact, if you have to make an emergency run in there, go down Tyler Street, if the railroad track is blocked with a train, um, the, I, don't know how you're gonna, I don't know how you're gonna power that carnival on two sides of that road, if that's what you're thinking where you say you want to use that land, that hedger land, that, that private land that's to the west side of Tyler Street there, uh, how, are they, how are you gonna power, because if you go down, when you go down to the riverfront down here, they, or when they had it up towards the JC Park, they had, they had to bury cables, not bury them, they just coned them over the road. So they were, tr you were running, which is fine. But that type of a situation, the road is, the road, Tyler Street is narrower down there than any other street, especially when you go around the bend down there. Mm -hmm. So just some, some things to consider, I would think before, I, it says on here you're gonna, you're gonna basically enter an agreement with them. I think we should probably look at some of the traffic issues and some of the parking issues, especially east of the, east of the railroad track. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Christy, were some of those things discussed at the committee level? They were, they were, and they're all valid concerns. Um, I think, in addressing the, the carnival, um, the reason we're asking for the carnival to be moved into what looks, seems like a really small area is um, the concern about safety. So we wanted to make sure that we're not spreading our police reserves too thin with having the carnival stay down in JC Park and then moving everything else to Levy. We're splitting our reserves in half. Um, and so that was kind of the big push to try and keep everything together. Um, and. In regards to emergency vehicles getting through Tyler Street, that's why we're keeping the street open. Um, we are going to have our command center right down um, near where the uh, labyrinth is. So they'll be right in that area where that controlled walkway will be uh, for, that, for that very reason. And then we're, we've also spent a lot of time to, in, or um, we've spent a lot of time looking at the budget to budget to um, invest in signage, excuse me. So we'll make sure that we'll have lots of adequate signage there on Tyler Street, making sure the cars are slowing down. And, and just to remind uh, council members that the Lock and Dam Road was open when it was in JC Park. So there was traffic going down that road as well. Um, in regards to the, park, the street parking, 
that's a, that's a good point. I think it's something that we'll continue to look at. Um, and this is something we're, we're going to continue to work with city staff on uh, to make sure that we have everything ironed out before the July date. I think that's uh, some valid concerns there. Councilmember Vaughn? Thank you, Your Honor. Christy, have, um, Pete brought up a good point on uh, utilities. I know the city has made a lot of investments on uh, down at JC Parks. There's a lot of plugins down there for the vendors to use. We don't, I don't know if we have that kind of infrastructure. I'm looking for Mr. Jenkins at, at this area for all those vendors to plug into. So I'm not sure if yeah, that's has the group looked at the infrastructure of power. That's a very good point. Uh, we have, and we've worked closely with Mr. Jenkins. He sent us over the electrical map. So everything that we need is at the pavilion for the music stage. We will have to invest in generators for uh, our food vendors and our commercial vendors, and that's something that we have uh, budgeted for. And I think that's a good point. I, I, I do get a little nervous about noise and fumes and everything else when you got a bunch of generators running, but it, I understand that's a solution too. Sure. Yeah. And we have historically had a generator down in JC Park. Um, I have sat right next to it, manning the beer tent. Um, it's not as noisy and obnoxious as you would think. We work with Ally Generators. They do a really good job. Okay, thank you. We have an, another member of the public who'd like to make a comment. Welcome. Welcome to the meeting. Santa Horning, I live down on East 3rd Street. And um, that was my concerns was the access accessibility um, you're going to have a buttoned area and so would that include that area where the road wraps underneath the railroad bridge oh no because if the carnival's on that side and so that won't be restricted button only and then Go ahead, um, Christy answer the question Okay, all right, and then, um, but it's just, and I know I don't live, I mean, I live downtown, and I know pe I volunteer at an agency, and I'm just kind of wondering about, like, so tenants, people that live downtown and do business, um, you know, as far as parking, would they be allowed to just kind of close off parking for their businesses or, you know, business that they have to um, conduct? like deliveries and and um and then also it was just the if we could really be guaranteed that there's going to be some good traffic control because i've like last year one time during the car show i literally circled like three times trying to find an open road and i couldn't find where the open road was so i finally went on one road and i was stopped and he's like where do you think you're going <laughs> And I said, well, I'm trying to get home. And um, and then just people, I mean, literally stopping their cars, looking around, um, walking, you know, they just kind of meander around. And so it would be really nice if the police could just really concentrate on keeping that traffic going, realizing that there are people that are trying to get to work, trying to get home. Um, well, it sounds you know, it's great. It's just uh, frustrating. The command center is going to be right near that area, so we're going to be able, uh, we're going to have reservists literally right on the spot. Okay. Just, yeah. all right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, why don't we go, go to council then for any additional comments or questions? Councilmember Lightfelt. Thank you, Your Honor. So, great explanation for the Tyler Street, why it's not being buttoned. I see some concerns both directions with it. To me, I'm almost seeing button it and have a contingency where it is open for emergency traffic because now you're going to have constant foot traffic going back and forth anyway. And for those of you who've taken your kids to the carnival, they go back and forth all night long. Every time they run out of money, they come back. So I'm, I have one concern there, which I know you'll take care of with staff of making sure people are safely getting across the road because as you said a train comes people are going to go around no offense but i don't know how long the train lasts <laughs> wow that is a that is a long time an hour and 15 minutes so definitely need to have that way around i would venture to just throw out there would it be possible to button that with a plan where safety vehicles 
can get through, you know? So God forbid we don't want to stop a fire truck or an ambulance from getting into the east side of town. We understand that. And then as far as traffic goes, we've seen it all over town. I mean, the craft fair was at Pioneer Park. You want to talk about traffic? There is not a decent road into Pioneer Park. It is all residential. There's no businesses in the area to support. It is just residential. And that was always a conflict. People were parking, you know, three quarters of a mile, walking in, that sort of thing. So there was always those concerns. But I love this. I love the focus because we are, it is River Town Days. And there are events going on all over town that we're going to be supporting. You know, get the people, get the focus down to these community or down to these businesses, down to this beautiful historic downtown and river. My gosh, it's, I think there's almost nothing like it. And, but all these other locations will be doing other events also. The Cub Mall does, you know, their some sales and fruit things in, in their parking lot. So there's other events that are going on throughout the city where I think as a public, we're going to be able to um, just support everybody in town. But this is beautiful and that walk to, and I missed that when I read through this, that the um, craft art and craft fair is moving to JC Park. Love that. You know, what people wanted, what people hated about Pioneer Park was there was no shade. It was 100 degrees walking around that craft show. So this, it's, it's obviously right on the river. We've got all that shade. I'm s very excited about this. And is it going to be different? Could it have some growing pains? Of course it will. Um, but congratulations to you and your team because this is obviously well thought out. And I'm excited for July. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Councilmember Member Balsani. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> G uh, getting back to the parking, <clears throat> a couple of suggestions. Uh, the uh, parking area, surface parking area around the old First National Bank. Uh, you could possibly talk to the uh, Confluence Development folks to see. I, I know we've got a parking ramp that's going to be built there. I'm not sure what their construction uh, timelines are, whether they're going to start turning shovels over or not. But um, about 30 to maybe 40 parking spaces right there. Also, this, and I'm, I'm looking here, this is Ward 2, so I'm kind of familiar with it. Uh, the northeast corner of Eddy and 4th is a large surface parking area that I believe is private and if we can find who the owners are there, uh, maybe see if some parking could happen there. And then a suggestion, uh, I'm, I'm pr I, I don't think we ever have any sporting events taking place at Wilson Park, and I'm looking at our parks director, uh, Chris. Yeah, there he is. Uh, it, it, is it possible that with the exception of the playground area, we could use Wilson Park for some additional surface parking. Uh, we, we, we have the playground area, we have the basketball courts, of course you're not gonna park on that. There is a ball diamond. Uh, but it's a you know, one square block area minus those uh, couple of things. And you might wanna take a look at that for some surface parking about the only thing you might ha I mean you know whether you'd stripe it or align it or anything I don't know uh, you'd probably have to put some gravel off the curb so when vehicles go up and down from the street on in but uh, you know that's a possibility and then the last one is the um, funeral home uh, in between fourth and fifth uh, uh, on uh, Spring Street they have off uh, off street parking there, and you may want to contact them about you know maybe using that. I know they allow uh, for uh, public parking when there are ball games there. They've been very nice, very cooperative with that. And since they tore down that um, uh, that home that uh, was burned in the you know burned down in the fire, they've got additional surface parking 
whether, and again, I don't know what their timeline is. I know they want to go in and curb it and, and put some asphalt in and so forth, but it might be ready to accept some more surface parking. So you could end up with another 100 parking places, you know, in and around that two, three block area. Uh, question that I have, uh, are, what's gonna be the staging area for the fireworks then? Are you gonna do them between the bridges? That's, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I will never be able to enjoy fireworks again, I'll just say that. Um, we have gone through several scenarios to try and get them closer to the pavilion area. Um, but there is a safety radius that comes with fireworks as you would expect. Um, so we've gone through about six different scenarios. Um, what also needs to take place is our permits. We have to run through a permit through the Coast Guard, Washington County, Dakota County, and then work with our local fire department. Um, so at this point, our permits are submitted for where they have historically been shot off. Um, just because, unfortunately, we were not able to get all those pieces together in time um, for this event. But it's something that the committee is going to continue to work on. Um, again, just a lot of moving parts, and um, there's a lot of residential and uh, commercial buildings down in that area, and, that's, and then we have the bridge, too. So um, we just gotta m make sure that uh, everyone's safe when they're lighting off fireworks. So um, we'll Did still have the fireworks. It just won't be as close to the pavilion as we had hoped that they yeah. would be. Uh, it, it was just a question, I, mm -hmm. uh, an enthusiastic question. Absolutely. Let's put it that way. Last thing on my part, uh, just a comment. I hope that you don't put anything in my labyrinth. <laughs> there. We've, we've had events down there in the past and we've had everything from uh, inflatable, you know, bouncing areas and so forth on the labyrinth. And I think the labyrinth is a, uh, a very critical part from an entertainment standpoint. Uh, uh, down there in that area, and I would really like to see that area stay as a labyrinth as opposed to anything else. Good suggestion. Whatever you can do. Absolutely. No, and we've been working with um, Chris. We know how sensitive that surface area is, so we don't want to have anything on there that might damage it. So right now it is staying open. It's all yours. I saw the red line going around it. Now. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to be sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. My Pete. <laughs> Appreciate that, Pete. That's a good point. And you're on just real quickly. I do want to just mention that there is a, um, going to be the big grassy area in JC Park that we've historically had for parking. Uh, we are working with Public Works to make sure that that is uh, available for this year, too. So um, just working out a couple kinks to see if we can get a sh shuttle back and forth, but that will be available. Okay. Council Member Fulch. Um, Your Honor, thank you. Uh, last night I gave uh, Harold Christensen a call, who's the president of the Eastside Association, and I know, Christy, thank you for speaking to him at length about what the neighborhood's concerns are. Um, and, and you know what? I have a lot of respect for what um, the folks in the, in, the, uh, in the audience have just shared, because when I was door knocking that, that neighborhood, I was shocked of the, the accounts that residents had and their experience of extreme difficulty in getting in, out, in and out of their neighborhood when there are special events going on. Literally, I had a person telling me about a situation where they were literally trying to get out of the neighborhood, they were having a medical emergency and they couldn't get out. And so it's real, it happens. And I think that that's you know, obviously why they're, they're so concerned about a repeat event. And so thank you for limiting parking on Tyler Street there, so to try to help you know keep keep things flowing, um, I would even ask to consider removing um, parking between 2nd Street and 3rd Street because, you know, folks who are coming into the neighborhood, they're probably, you know, coming down Vermillion Street and then cutting down like 4th Street or 3rd Street and they have a lot of difficulties trying to get in and around that area. So whatever you can do to try to keep it open so that there's limited, you know, pedestrian traffic on Tyler, between t the, that intersection of Tyler and 2nd Street in that area, I'm sure that they would um, welcome that. I see heads bobbing. So yeah, it's bad for them. And, uh, and the other thing that I wanted to bring up, um, which I don't think you 
had a slide up for was the parade route. Oh. And so if you have, do you have I that in I your apologize, slide I don't have it as, as a slide. Um, so what Harold said is that it helps tremendously now that the parade route is going down Ramsey Street, that that helps them out, but there's still a lot of confusion um, for folks who are trying to get in the neighborhood about how they get across because the because the parade starts at noon, but staging starts at 11. And so it's really, those neighborhoods are blocked off for two hours. And, um, and Harold was saying that people are trying to get down to the marina and they can't figure out how to get out, to get around and get in there as well to get to their boats. And so people will be literally locked out for hours trying to get in um, to the neighborhood. And so, um, so I, I think what happens is that, if I remember correctly, with the staging the last two years is that um, I think that the, the reserves try to help let folks get across at Tyler and 10th, but a lot of people don't know to go that far up, that if you like go down to like 9th Street and then come around and go around Kennedy and then try to come down um, Tyler that way, that that's one way to get in. But I was wondering if there could be possibly another way for residents to get in and until you know the parade actually starts at noon or even if there could be um, you know intermediate traffic you know let go to go through the parade like at 4th Street um, because there do become you know gaps within um, the parade route just to help alleviate some of that stress that the neighborhood goes under you know because it is a lot to ask they do go through quite a bit um, during River Town days as it has been in the past, and 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 I, we all, I think, feel the same that we're happy about what you're doing, but it's just to try to minimize the the impact and the the stress, the duress that these folks have to go through. I think that that would help a lot, and that if we could clearly communicate, you know, what those access points are going to be ahead of time. I know that some of the neighborhood has a um, an email distribution list. I'm not sure how else we can, you know, get information. Um, out to them if it could be a direct mailing or something like that, but just to help communicate, like how do you get in and out? Because I mean, their anxiety is real, and so whatever we can do to uh, you know alleviate so that they're not trapped inside of their neighborhood during the, you know, during the parade or vice versa, the tra trapped out, I think would go a long ways. So okay, sure. no, very very good suggestions, Councilmember, and I'll continue to work with Chief Schaefer on the um, traffic control and then anything that I can do to get a communication out ahead of time is a, is a good idea. We send a communication out on 10th Street just because we're blocking it off for staging, but if there is a way to mark off alternative routes uh, to send it over to the e east side of the train bridge, I absolutely will. Okay, thank you, yeah. Christy. I know you always do an excellent job, so. Thank you. Thanks. You know, no, uh, tonight we have the 2018 Rivertown Days Agreement before us, but that doesn't mean after we pass it tonight that we just stop learning and start tweaking things. So. Even though we may pass this agreement today, we, there is an agreement between the city and the chamber that we need to pass, but that doesn't close off any, you know, ideas that we get for between now and Rivertown days to make things better. So that will continue, discussions will continue, so uh, everyone can have a great weekend that weekend, please, and, and especially the East Siders, okay? All right? I'm going to close, I'm going to close you for that, uh, Pete. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor so, and Council. Could I, all right. So, uh, Council, is there any other um, any other uh, uh, discussions regarding this? So I'm open to a motion. Councilmember Vaughn makes a motion to approve, second by Councilmember Balsanic. Uh, motion is before the body. Is there any further motion or uh, discussion to the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The motion prevails. Uh, next, we have a comments from the audience. Are there any comments from the audience this evening? Any comments from the audience? Okay, seeing none, council announcements. Announcements, Councilmember Fulch. Thank you, Your Honor. I just wanted to bring up about roughly two weeks ago, there was a kickoff for the Dakota Broadband Board, which is a joint powers uh, entity. Um, the city of Hastings has opted in. Uh, Dakota County is taking the lead and many of the other cities um, are have joined that and we've had discussion before the council here in the, in the past, but um, we just finally had our kickoff, like I, I said. Um, the, the point of the group is to collaborate to create a high-speed fiber network within our county. And uh, just to give a quick update on, on where the group is going, um, we just you know did the procedural 
adoption of bylaws and organizational structure. But what was interesting is that the, the group um, needs to determine who would like to be the fiscal agent and then who's going to take the lead on like technical staff, who's gonna facilitate and take the lead of coordinating with um, contractors and such. And um, there is gonna be a steering committee that is uh, going to be created and it's of the city administrators. So Melanie, I'm sure has received something about this already. Um, if she would like to be a, a part of that or if she has a IT technical person, she'll appoint to be on that. But what was interesting is that, as a long way around, is that, um, so the piece with the fiscal agent, um, Lakeville has taken the, the lead and, oh, I, Joe, what are you on? You're on the- um, DCC. Yes, yes, the DCC, and I think, so it was. Oh, yes, the 9117. Thank yeah, you. Talk Sorry, mm -hmm. pay attention. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, right. And so there is an opportunity that funding might go with that. So if we wanted, um, if we, Lakeville said that they actually funded a full person, like they needed a half an accounting staff person, and they were able to take that supplemental funding and able to create a full staff person and so um, and then you know the same could be true with um, if if we wanted to have you know, if we just wanted to add on if we needed additional staff and we didn't have enough funds or you know we didn't have enough for a full person to do perhaps that that's something that the city could take into consideration because they're going to be looking for that um, that direction they're looking for cities to volunteer to take on that those roles and um, so anyhow so those are the next steps, scoping um, what work needs to be done and then recruiting cities to take the lead on those. Well, I understand you already made one significant move. And my good friend, uh, Invergrove Heights Mayor George Torville is the chair of the committee. Yeah, the he, right? he did. So he that was, that's, you're off to a good start. He was yeah. a yeah. very, yeah. <laughs> so uh, good luck with George on that one. Yeah, enthusiastic kind of fella. <laughs> okay, thank you for that update, right, appreciate thanks. it. Is there any other announcements, council members? If not, I have a few announcements. Uh, on Thursday, March 22nd, uh, this Thursday, council members Balsanic, Fulch, Lund, and Vaughn will be attending the 2018 Legislative Conference uh, for Cities, part of the League of Minnesota Cities uh, Conference in St. Paul in regards to the current legislative session. I'll already be there, so I'm looking forward to seeing you near the House Chamber uh, on that day. Uh, there are also on that evening on Thursday, March 22nd, there will be an appreciation banquet for the volunteer police reservists at 6 p.m. at the Green Mill. And uh, you know, we, as many of you know, we're very fortunate in the city to have a dedicated group of volunteers to help us out with our public safety needs. And we certainly do appreciate their work at Rivertown Days. Uh, it's a fantastic organization. So if you have an opportunity to stop by and say hi to them at the appreciation banquet this Thursday at 6 p.m. at the Green Mill. On Friday, March 23rd at 11 a.m., Council Members Brox and Fultz will be attending the 33rd Annual 360s Communities Domestic and Sexual Violence Awareness Luncheon at Brackets Crossing uh, Country. And so thank you for representing our great city there at that event. That's important. 360s is a significant uh, metro area, Dakota County area uh, collaborative, and uh, I certainly appreciate all that they do in Hastings in regards to the Lewis House. And so uh, thank you for representing our city there. On Monday, March 26th, the city will hold a workshop to review the draft Remain Street plan. So we're gonna start the, that's gonna have uh, some building blocks of that plan come before the council. And uh, so we look forward to seeing everyone next Monday at 6.30 for that. And then Monday, April 2nd at 7 p.m., uh, the day after Easter, the next regular city council meeting is scheduled for, okay? And uh, council, I have no other business before our body. A motion to adjourn is in order. Council Member Balsanic makes that motion to adjourn. Second by Council Member Fultz. A non-debatable motion. All those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Those opposed nay. The motion prevails and we are adjourned. Thank you.